Jesus Christ, I hope and pray you're on the winning side today. If you're not, you can get on the winning side. You don't want to be on a losing side, I'll tell you that right now. If you're not saved, you're on a losing side. Period. You get saved, you get on the winning side. I've been reading through the Old Testament again. I always enjoy going through the Bible each year. And I just uh, finished, well, I finished Leviticus this morning. But reading through Exodus, I always enjoy the, the Exodus. I enjoy seeing how God got the nation, His nation of Israel, out of bondage and released them into freedom. And so the message today really is entitled, Pharaoh versus Moses. Now, if you've read your Bible, if you know anything about the Exodus or you know anything about your Bible, you know who won. Who won between Moses and Pharaoh? Moses. Pharaoh ends up losing, losing probably his own life, and he lost his entire army to God. God was the one that destroyed Pharaoh and his army. But also when we think about the, the Pharaoh versus Moses thing in the book of Exodus, we think about this also, Satan versus God. Now we all know who wins there, as we just heard in the song. God wins. There are times that it looks like Satan is winning. It's like any game. Um, Watch the Syracuse basketball game yesterday. TJ had to tell me when it was on, so I had to watch a little bit of it. And uh, the the score was a seesaw score all the way through. It looked like Syracuse was going to lose. And then at the buzzer beater, the player for Syracuse tosses a three-pointer, swish at the buzzer, and Syracuse wins the game. And so Syracuse fans were excited. The dome went nuts. But through the game, it looked like that they weren't going to win because they were down, seemed like they were down more than they were, seemed like they trailed more than they were ahead in the game. And football games do the same thing, right? I mean, big football playoffs. Some of you people are just so involved in football games. Basketball, football games, baseball's coming up means nothing in eternity, but we enjoy watching them, right? But the scores seem to seesaw back and forth, and that's the way it seems like with Satan and God. It seems like Satan gets the victory sometimes, and and it may even seem like Satan gets the victory in people's lives, and the country is going through just a bizarre time, and it seems like people might be asking, where is God during this time? But we have to remember that at the end of the book, God wins. Christians win. We don't lose. Now, it may seem like the score is in the other favor, but we win in the end. Anyway, Exodus chapter 1. Let's let's get into this. Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. When you find it, I'll ask you to stand. I will read verses 1 through 14 out loud. You don't have to read out loud. You can just stand there and follow along. Exodus chapter uh, chapter 1, verses... 1 through 14. The last person to arise. Now I can read. (laughs) I'll read you follow along. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, 
lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them and their burdens, with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. You know what that word rigor means? Cruelty, hardness. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field and all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Father, thank you for the passage of Scripture we just read. I pray that you bless the message now as it goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to just start off by saying this, and I know that you probably understand and believe this, but the devil is real. The devil is not, the devil is portrayed by many people as this red suited, horned, long tail, he's got a pitchfork, and in hell he goes around poking people. That's what we see, you know, that's what the the crazy people out there, that's how they view the, the devil. That is not the devil. The devil is alive and he's well and he's on planet earth doing all of the things that he does. The Bible even calls him as an, he's an, as an angel of light. He appears good, he sounds good, he, everything about him looks good, but he, we know how evil and wicked he is and what a trick master he is. So he's real. And all of his fallen angels that followed him when he fell from heaven, they're real also. Remember, the devil can't be in every place all the time. He's not omniscient. He's he's not omnipotent. He's not anything like God is. He is a created being, and he he can only be in one place at one time. But he's got a lot of cronies that are all over the place doing a lot of serious business. So the devil is a very real, real individual. He's not in hell. Someday he'll be cast into the lake of fire. That'll be a good day for all that are standing there watching that. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I think it's going to be a good day for all of us. I think we'll be shouting and saying hallelujah when God, Jesus Christ himself, tosses him or kicks him or throws him by the seat of his pants into the lake of fire. And that's where he'll spend all eternity. He won't just burn up. That's where he, he will be for all eternity. The Bible says in John 8, 44, Ye are of the, your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is a liar. He's a murderer. He'll try to get you to believe things that, that, that sound good, but they're not good. God wants to do this. God wants to lighten your burdens. He wants to lessen the bitterness, and He wants to liberate you from bondage. And we see that that's exactly what Pharaoh was doing with these children of Israel. He was causing these things to be done with them. He was causing them to have heavy burdens in verse 11. He was afflicting them with these burdens. In verse 14 it says, And they they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. Bitter with hard bondage. We see the burdens, the bitterness, and the bondage mentioned here in this passage of Scripture. Those things that we see here is the devil's work. Now we're going to look at two things today, basically two things, the devil's work and God's work. And so listen please carefully to this message. The devil's work is to always bring burdens and afflictions. That's what he wants in you and me. He wants to burden us with afflictions. Look at chapter 5 of Exodus in verses 4 through 9. 5, chapter 5 of Exodus, verses 4 through 9. This is what the devil loves to do. 5.4, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? 
And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks which they did make hitherto, uh, heretofore, ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle, therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. You know what Pharaoh's doing? He's putting more burdens on the people. He's just giving them harder work. They used to bring the straw to them, and they would take the clay, the, the, the clay that was mixed with water, and they would mix in the straw with them because they had all the straw provided. Pharaoh says, hey, look, obviously you've got way too much time on your hands, Moses and Aaron. You're coming to me, and you're saying that you want the people to be released to go and worship. Uh, we're just going to make it harder on you. And so you've got to go and find your own straw now. You're going to go get your own straw. You're going to continue on, and you're not going to diminish the brick count that you're doing every single day. Day. Matter of fact, I want you to make more bricks. That's exactly what the devil does. Now, these bricks were straw was added to the clay for the binding purposes. The straw would hold the clay together. In ancient buildings, the clay and the straw bricks were at the bottom for the foundation part of the building. Then clay and stubble was at the next level above them. And at the top of the building was just clay bricks. Uh, they were just at the top. They didn't need stubble or straw for any purpose. They had wanted the strength at the bottom of the building, and then it proceeded upward. The size of these bricks were approximately 13 by 13 by three and a half inches. They were often stamped with the name of the king on them. So they have to put Pharaoh's name in those bricks as they were making them, as they were drying, before they were drying. They had to gather their own straw for the bricks and still put out that same number of bricks, if not more. The burden was hard work, extremely hard. Many times the devil has us work for so many things that matter not in eternity. He gives us all these things and we want to get involved in all these things around us. And they're not bad. They may not be sinful things, but so often the devil gives us all these things to do that matters not for eternity. We get so involved in all of these things, we're working hard, and it tires us out, so we can't be effective for Jesus Christ. So many Christians tell me today sometimes, Pastor, I'd come to church, but I'm just worn out. I'm just, I'm too tired to come to church. After all, Pastor, God told us to work six days and rest on a seventh day. And since I don't have to work on Sunday, that's my day of rest. The, the Bible does teach a six-day work week. It does teach that. And it teaches that we are to work hard for six days and rest on the seventh day, whatever that is. It doesn't have to be um, one of these specific... No, it doesn't have to be the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, it was the Sabbath. In the New Testament, uh, the first day of the week is the Lord's Day, and this is the day we gather together to church, at church. But why do we have to work so hard during the week that we can't get up and come to church on Sunday? Now, thank God you got up this morning and you came to church on Sunday. But a lot of people, that's their day when they, they want to stay home, they want to sleep in, <clears throat> they just want to rest because God told them to rest a day. Well, you know, the, the day of rest was designed to be a spiritual rest day. So when you come to church... I'm the guy that has to do all the work. The pastor doesn't get a day off. I don't take a day off. Some pastors take Monday or Friday or another day. I don't take a day off. I'll be up early tomorrow working through the day, working in the school, helping here, doing there. I don't take a day off. Um, and on Sundays, it's my busiest day of work. So I, I, don't, I can't rest on, the, on Sunday. So you shouldn't either. <laughs> Get to church. Be in church. It's 
Stop using that, that as an excuse. But so often we do that, we'll use these excuses that we have. And one of these days I'm going to bring another message on excuses. But so many people, have they have no time for church. They have no time to read the Bible. They have no time to pray. They have no time to do anything for God. Why? Because they're too busy. We see that back in our text in verse 14. Exodus 1, 14. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor, hard work, cruelty. You know what the devil loves to do? First of all, he loves to bring the burdens and the afflictions. Secondly, he loves to bring bitterness. Let's coast there for a little bit. Let's talk about bitterness for a few minutes. Because the Bible says that that was the goal of Pharaoh, was to bring bitterness to the children of Israel. And when I liken Pharaoh to the devil, I see that the devil likes to bring bitterness to you and I. Bitterness is a struggle for some people. Bitterness, listen to me, bitterness is an attitude of resentment and disgust against people, circumstances, and God. I'll say that again. Bitterness is an attitude of resentment and disgust against people, circumstances, and God. Bitterness is the refusal to accept God's plan and will for your life. That's what bitterness really is. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Hebrews 12, 15. Hebrews 12, 15. Look indiligently, lest any man uh, fail you, a fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A root of bitterness. Bitterness also is the refusal to thank God for each person and situation in my life. You've got some people in your life that you, don't want, you won't thank God for. There are some situations in your life that you refuse to thank God for because you just think that it's not fair, it's not right, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be thinking that way, those people shouldn't have done what they did to me, they shouldn't have said what they said to me, they shouldn't have whatever. And you just you, you have a bitterness against certain people and that results in a bitterness even towards God. It extends into a bitterness towards God because you have bitterness towards somebody. Again, bitterness is the refusal to thank God for each person and situation in my life. Well, preacher, how can I thank God for that? I mean, that was awful. That was terrible. I know not everything that happens to us is nice and fun and lovely. We understand that. But we should always have an attitude of being thankful no matter what. And remember, God makes no mistakes. Remember, God is good all the time. We say that. It's, we even made t-shirts with that here in our church. God is good all the time, right? We say that. If I start the little phrase, God is good, you respond all the time. But, you know, we say that, but do we really believe that? No, some of us don't believe that. Some of us will say it because we don't want somebody to see me not saying it. Bitterness is that refusal to thank God for each person and situation in my life. Let me give you some... What is bitterness like? Bitterness is displayed by anger. Bitterness is displayed by sin. Bitterness is displayed by, <clears throat> help me Lord, complaining. <laughs> complaining. Some of you, you get an A in that category. Some of you are chief complainers. Some of us are chief complainers. I'm actually trying not to complain about the winter this year. I, thank you, my dear. She says I'm doing pretty good. Thank God for that. I thank the Lord today for the plow in the truck out here. Hallelujah. And I thank God I got that little button. I can sit in the doorway and push it. 
and I listen. Ah, it started. And I had the heat already cranked up, so I hang my key back up, and I go do something. And then in a little while, I go out to the truck, and I get in it, and I do my little thing. You have to put the key in, turn it, and then put your foot on the brake, or it'll stall out, you know, just to wait. And it's already warm. So good. <laughs> so good. Hallelujah. If you don't have one of those, I really feel sorry for you. <laughs> How many of you had one, have one of those things in your vehicle? Yeah, look at you all. You're all. You feel sorry. You feel sorry for them too. But I'm trying not to complain about the winter. I used to be a big complainer about the winter. I don't like snow. I don't like cold. But I know that God, and I have to remind myself, and I even have to tell God, I said, God, you made that snow out there. The snow falls because of you. And God, you gave the cold, so I'll take it. But I said the other day, I'm waiting for spring. <laughs> I'm waiting for the hot summers again. Kathy said to me yesterday, she said, if you had your choice between Puerto Rico, Florida, or Mississippi, and they weren't cold down, it's cold down south. Now, Puerto Rico's never cold. It's 85 every day. I says, I don't know what I would take. I'd take one of them. <laughs> All right, bitterness is displayed by the silent treatment. Sometimes we do that with our spouses. Yeah. I hope you don't do that. Sometimes we do that with people we care about. We just do the silent treatment. That's because that's a result of bitterness. Bitterness is displayed by avoiding people. Do you have anybody that you like to avoid? Well, you're, you're bitter towards them. Bitterness is displayed by unkind remarks. Bitterness is displayed by refusal to get involved or to help somebody that needs it. Even bitterness is displayed by, you know the church needs something and you just refuse to do it. Maybe you're harboring some bitterness against the church or the pastor, or somebody in the church. Bitterness is displayed by a desire to get even. I had a guy that worked for me, and on the back of his truck, he had a sign that said, I don't get mad, I get even. And he meant it. Is there anybody like that in this room? I don't get mad, I get even. Some people have said that. I hope you don't ever mean that. For the Christian, we, don't ever, we should never, ever have that thought. The Bible speaks against getting even with anybody, regardless of what anybody has done to you or through you or whatever. And bitterness is displayed by divisions, causing divisions. Divisions in the church, divisions in families, divisions in relationships. That is what bitterness is. Now, there's five consequences of a bitter spirit. Let me give those to you, five. The spiritual consequence of a bitter spirit is you have no spiritual power. You are powerless with God if you have a bitter spirit. How can Holy Spirit work through you, yeah. preach through you, teach through you, witness through you, do anything through you if you have a bitter spirit? Amen. God can't work through a bitter spirit. That's right. God can't work through a bitter person. He's, his, his hands are, he can't do a thing. And so spiritually, you have no spiritual power whatsoever. You're doing everything on your own. And when you try to do everything on your own, you'll burn out after a while. You've got to have God to help you. You've got, you have to have the Holy Spirit with you. And so spiritually speaking, you have no spiritual power. Well, secondly, the physical aspect. Look at Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. How about the physical aspect of a bitter spirit? Proverbs chapter 17, look at verse 22. <clears throat> I want everybody to see this verse. Some of you already know what it says, but let's look at it. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like what? A medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. That could be depression, that could be bitterness, that could be anything, that broken spirit. But a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So secondly, not only the spiritual aspect, but how about the physical aspect? People will get sick over their bitterness. 
literally physically sick. You say, how does that happen? Well, I don't know either. I don't understand it, but people will physically get sick. They'll lose sleep. And when you lose sleep and you're not getting the rest that you need, you can get sick, physically sick, physically weak with that. Third thing, the third consequence of this bitter spirit, you got spiritual, physical. How about the mental? No peace, depression, deception. Mentally, you're, you're just, mentally, you're, 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 you're destroyed mentally when you're harboring bitterness. And then the fourth thing is the emotional part. That's the depression, that's the irritableness. And then there's even a social aspect of a consequence of a bitter spirit. Socially, you'll drive people away. People won't want to come up to you and shake your hand with a bitter spirit because they just can see that you're, you're bitter. And there are some people that don't like to be around bitter people. Happy people are drawn to happy people. Okay, bitter people are drawn to bitter people. I think so. I think so. Birds of a feather flock together. And so if you're bitter, you're probably looking for another bitter spirit to be around, another bitter person to be around. Let me see if I can find a bitter person. And so you're looking for a bitter person. But happy people, looking for a happy person. So socially, you'll, you'll drive people away. You'll look critical on others. You'll be a very critical person. You'll make unwise decisions socially. And here's the topper <clears throat> of the social one. You will be grumpy. You will be grumpy. All right, husbands and wives, stop looking at one another. You're, you're, telling, your, you're telling your tales. I, I, I already know what's going on out there. But you will be grumpy. And so being bitter bars our prayers, banishes our peace, breaks our fellowship, bottles up hatred, and barricades God's blessings. That's what bitterness does. And the devil knows that if he can get you bitter and keep you bitter... For as long as he can, you will be useless for Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he wants. Can I get that person bitter? What can I toss their way to get them bitter? How can I ruin their day? How can I upset their apple cart? What can I do to get them bitter? And then you feed right into it. You become bitter. And then you stay bitter. And you stay bitter. And you stay bitter. And you are now useless for Jesus Christ. Your Bible reading hurts, your prayer life hurts, your church attendance hurts, your family hurts, people around you that you work with hurt because you're bitter. You're just bitter. And after several weeks and months, you go to them and say, hey, you could do this. Why are you bitter? They'll probably say, hmm, I don't know. I got bitter back a while ago. Somebody looked at me funny, this pastor didn't shake my hand. Recently, somebody told me that I said something to somebody, which I don't re ever call saying that, and, but that's why they don't come to church anymore, because I said something to them. And then the same person said, well, uh, some missionary didn't shake my hand, and so I'm not coming back. Well, if I miss your hand, I'm so sorry. I try to get every hand in here. But if I miss your hand, please don't be bitter. Let's do this right now. Everybody put your right hand down. All right, now let's do this. Ready? Up and down. Okay. If I miss your hand later, I got it just now. <laughs> Let me give you six ways to get freedom from bitterness. You ready? Write these down. If you're bitter, write them down. 
If you're not bitter, write them down. <laughs> you will be someday, probably. But gaining freedom from your bitterness, if you have any bitterness. First of all, number one, write this down. Admit the problem. Say to God, God, I'm bitter. God says, I know it. You've been bitter to me for a long time. I've been trying to get through to you for a while, and you've just been bitter. But tell God, I'm bitter. God, I'm, I'm, I'm bitter. And you could even give God the reason. You could, you know, pastor said this, pastor didn't do this, this one didn't do that, that one had this, my wife, my husband, my kids, my, my friend, my boss, my whatever. You can give him all the reasons, but l at least admit that you are bitter. That's step number one in taking care of your bitterness, Amen. is admit you got a bitterness problem. Amen. Most people don't want to admit it. I'm not bitter. You're crazy. <laughs> I'm not bitter. I'm going to pop you in the nose. Well, you're bitter. Just admit it. Number two, confess your sin. Because bitterness is a sin. Come on, let's admit it. It's a sin. So admit the problem, confess your sin. Number three, see each person and situation as God's tool. Amen. Just see each person and, and situation as God's tool. God, okay, all right, I give up. I give up, God. What are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to, what are you trying to do, God? Look at it as a tool in your life. And, and, and God will show you. God will help you. This, he's, he's just saying, listen, okay, I just want to build you up in this area. I want to help you in this area. But see each person and situation as God's tool. Number four, <laughs> thank God for each. Amen. Just thank God. Thank you, Lord, for the snow. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for the cold. Thank you, Lord, for the wetness out there. Thank you, Lord, for the mud coming. Thank you, Lord, for the, whatever the situation in your life. Thank you, Lord, for the heartache. Help me to learn from it. Strengthen me. But thank God for each. Number five, seek forgiveness if, if needed from maybe the person you were bitter towards. Seek forgiveness if needed. <clears throat> Get them all down? Number six, practice the Word of God. Just do what the Bible says. Do you know this has the prescription for life? Right? This, this will help you in every situation. If you're bitterness, if you're bitter, full of bitterness, read the Bible. God will help you. God will get you through it. And then the third thing that we see that Pharaoh was doing towards those children of Israel, he was trying to bring bondage to them. Bondage. And he, and he did. He succeeded for a long time to keep them under bondage. It took God to release the children of Israel out of Egypt. The invisible chains of bondage, listen to me, is bitterness. Bitterness will put you in bondage and keep you there as long as you're bitter. You'll be in bondage. There'll be groanings. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, it says, They were groaning. Bondage will bring you into that groaning stage. 2.23, it says, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. God heard their groaning, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. But God had to hear their groanings. Bondage brings groanings. Bondage, bondage brings complaining and grumbling and griping about all kinds of things. There's a lot of moaning and groaning and complaining while in bondage. That's all that bondage does. It's, it's a result of that bitterness that you might have. So the devil is real. The devil is working. The devil is doing everything he can to bring you under this burdens and bitterness and bondage. That's exactly what the devil is trying to do to you and to me. And too often, we allow him to win in our own personal lives. Here's what God does. 
God reduces the burdens. Chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Quickly, I'm, I know I'm... I just want to give you the last few points of this message because it'll help. If it hasn't helped already. But Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, and verse 7, it says... Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Only God can reduce the burdens if you have any in your life. Only God can reduce and remove the burdens. But you've got to trust Him explicitly. You've got to trust Him completely. You've got to say, God, I can't do this. God, I've got too many burdens. I've got too much bitterness. And God, I need your help. God heard the groanings. God heard the children of Israel with their, with their burdens and with the, all the things they were going through, God, He heard that and He sent help and He released them from Egypt eventually. You may get tired in the work of the Lord, but you will never get tired of the work of the Lord. We all get tired in the work of God, but I'll tell you, I don't ever get tired of the work of God. I don't ever get tired of preaching or tired of pastoring or tired of teaching or tired of preparing sermons. I don't get tired of that. I get tired. In my old age, I notice I'm going to bed a lot earlier at night. But I still get up early in the morning. But God reduces the burdens. Number two, God removes the bitterness. And we don't have time to read this whole chapter, but... Read this later on if you get a chance. Read Exodus 15. All the Israelites, Moses, they're out of Egypt. God won the battle for them. God, you know the story. He, Moses held up his rod and God opened up the Red Sea and they passed through on dry ground. And in the process of all of that, God let the waters come in on top of Pharaoh and his army and drown the whole Egyptian army. Amen. Took care and wiped out Pharaoh and, his, and all of his cronies. And the children of Israel got safely on the other side of the Red Sea, and they started their wilderness wanderings, yes. But Moses writes a song right after that whole ordeal and just brings glory to God. And so the bitterness, Moses held no bitterness about what was going on in the past. He allowed the Red Sea crossing and the whole thing beyond the other side of the sea to be the past. I think what we need sometimes is we need a Red Sea crossing. We need to get through the Red Sea on dry ground. We need to leave our burdens behind us and let them just drown in the Red Sea. But Moses sang a song in chapter 15, and only Christ can remove the bitterness that you're harboring. If you're harboring any bitterness, Christ can remove it. Many a Christian's life has been ruined, testimonies have been destroyed, works that were done be forgotten because of one thing called bitterness. Amen. And God removes the bondage. As I just read there in Exodus 6, 6, it was God that did it. You know the story of all of the, the way that God got him out of Egypt. Had to bring down ten plagues upon Pharaoh and his, the nation of Egypt. Pharaoh finally released the children of Israel and they were able to leave Egypt and God watched out for them the entire journey. So God reduces the burdens, He removes the bitterness, and He removes us from the bondage that we have or maybe in. If you're lost today, you're in bondage. You're in bondage if you're not saved. You've got chains wrapped around you so tight that you can't break yourself free. But Christ holds the key to those chains of bondage. Amen. Through salvation, those chains of bondage can be re removed from you. You can be released from bondage and you can have freedom to live the way that God wants you to live. 
The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are, you are in bondage and you need to be released. You may be harboring bitterness in your soul today. I don't know. I look out upon you. All I see is your face. I can't see your heart. I have no clue if there's, if there's any bitterness in this room at all. Sometimes you can look at a face and say, eh, there might be some bitterness there. But I don't know that. that only God knows that and you know that. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation, and I would invite you to come to the altar. If you have bitterness and you need to leave it here, I would pray that this would be your Red Sea crossing right here. You come down here today. You say, God, I'm sick of my bitterness. I'm tired of being bitter towards, and you can fill in the blank. I'm tired about this bitterness that I've had in my life. I'm tired. I, I can't get the victory over it. God, I have too many burdens that only you can help me with. And let this be your Red Sea parting here. If you're not saved, why don't you make your way out in a moment when the music plays and come down here and we'll take this Bible and we'll show you how you can be saved. You can be saved gloriously today. And the bondage will be broken. No longer will you be in bondage but you've got to get saved if you're not saved. Again, whatever God, the Holy Spirit tells you to do, I want you to do it today. Father, thank you for the message. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures we looked at today, and I pray that you would work and move upon each and every one of us right now. You know what we all need, Lord. I have no idea. You know who's saved, and you know who isn't. You know who may be here harboring bitterness and and, and just heavy with burdens, Lord, I pray that you would just help that person or people. Lord, bless this invitation, and I pray that you would just work mightily right now. In Jesus' name, amen.